All right, everybody. Well, here we go. This is spring term remote instruction classroom number one. Total core form, welcome to the class. I'm here in my dining room. I have a chalkboard actually in my dining room. As you can see, I have the self-quarantine count up that uh, I started last week to keep track of how long the family's been locked down. Now I have left the house. I've been to the grocery store. I went today, so I'm not completely quarantined, but uh, the kids haven't been out of the house except for walks uh, in now 14 days. So that's gonna stay up there. You're gonna see that counting up. Uh, today's actually Thursday, March 26th. The term doesn't even start until uh, a few more days, but I'm getting out ahead of this. I won't say too much here at the beginning because really what I wanna do is try to give you a video lecture for our first class. This is what I would do on the first class of political reform, PolySci 419. So that's where we are, PolySci 419 political reform, and today's lecture is going to be political reform versus other types of reform. So, what is reform in general, and how does political reform differ from other types of reform? That's basically what I'm going to talk about today. On Thursday, I'm going to discuss, well, I don't know if it'll be Thursday, it'll be whenever I record it, but it would be next Thursday's class, but lecture number two is going to be a discussion of the different avenues of uh, political reform, and I may probably gesture towards those today, but just know that I'll go more deeply into them uh, in the future. So what is reform? Well, it's, I hate to be so literal about it, but reform is a reformation of some kind of a system or a structure. And any type of reform means that you're taking something that already exists and you're transforming it. And one of the things about reform is that what you're doing is you're taking a pre-existing system that clearly has a purpose and a goal, but a problem, right? So reform is structure, so we have a pre-existing system that has a purpose and then also a problem. And so what you're looking to do whenever you do reform of any kind is you're looking to stay true to the purpose and attempt to fix the problem. And that's what we're going to be thinking about every time we talk about political reform is that, okay, there's a structure that exists. We have an electoral structure, we have a legislative structure, we have some form of uh, citizen participation or engagement, we have a judicial system, whatever it happens to be, whatever part of the political system we're going to be looking at it. We're going to take it apart and look at various kinds or various pieces of it. Uh, the idea is it exists for a reason, right? Why do we have elections, right? We have elections. There's a purpose. We have an electoral structure. Uh, the purpose is to attempt to translate uh, votes into, or excuse me, the, the, the attempt is to translate the popular will into outcomes, representation. And uh, the voting uh, method is, is how you do that. And so that's the purpose. And if you go to, if you have an electoral system that you think is broken, uh, and of course one of the most common ones that people point to is the electoral college, and we'll we'll talk about that in this class. Uh, it's a structure, and if people think well it's broken, what's the problem, right? And knowing what the problem is is really usually the easiest part. Uh, it's one, how do you fix it? But of course, like how do you fix it and stay true to the purpose? The Electoral College is a tricky one because the purpose of it is to choose one person, I mean a vice president as well, but set that guy aside, but it's to choose one person to represent the entire country. Um, and what that means is that a lot of people who don't want that one person are going to be unhappy with the result. Uh, and so there's really, because the purpose is to do that, to choose one person, it's never going to be the case that no matter what you do to fix it, that it's not going to mean that some people are going to end up with a president that they don't want. So you can't say, well, the, the, the fix has to be that everybody's happy with it or that we come up with a system that gets rid of uh, that sort of deep underlying nature. Part of the purpose of the uh, electoral system for choosing a president, whatever the electoral system is, is to get one person. That's the purpose. It's not to please everybody. It's not necessarily even to express the popular will. It's to choose one person who, for a four-year term, gets to represent uh, the entire country. So if we think there's a problem with it, we're going to try to fix it, keeping that in mind. Now, 
this is uh, one type of political reform is fixing the or changing reforming the presidential election system. There are so many corners of our democratic system, and we're going to look. Hopefully, we're going to go to as many different corners as we possibly can. Uh, but this lecture is actually about political reform versus other types of reform, and so I want to get into that. So, what is political reform and other types? Well. The word reform is really used widely in politics. There's welfare reform, immigration reform, healthcare reform, tax reform. It's pretty much one of the most common uh, terms. And where that term is used, and sometimes it's misused, uh, but where that term is used appropriately is where there's a pre existing structure, right? There is healthcare uh, legislation, there are statutes, there are regulations, there's a system in place, and the idea of the other type of reform is to change policy so that the system, the regulatory and programmatic system as it exists, is improved. So basically, other types are policy. And the idea here is that the policy system as it exists is failing to do something, or it's doing something poorly, right? With healthcare reform, there are a lot of uh, failures that people have identified, but one of them is there are lots of people who don't have uh, health insurance, and that's considered to be a problem, right? And what's the purpose? With other types of policy, it's actually really tricky to kind of know what the purpose is, because part of what the argument over the policy area is, is, well, what is this purpose, right? If we, what is the purpose of federal healthcare policy, or state-level healthcare policy, or county or, or local healthcare policy? What's the purpose of it? Different people are going to have different ideas about what that purpose is. Uh, some people might say the purpose is to make sure that we have a high level of well-being. Other people are going to say the purpose is to make sure that the healthcare marketplace operates as effectively and efficiently as possible. Other people are going to say the purpose is to make sure that the most vulnerable populations get the kind of care they need. And other people are going to say, no, the purpose is actually to make sure that people get what they're capable of paying for, not what they need. So already, this right here is going, for other types of, uh, of reform, there's going to be disagreement. There's going to be an argument here. And what's actually often the case is that once you finish that argument, or when people agree, the fix is generally uh, you know, relatively straightforward. Like if you agree that the idea is that every American has access to at least decent health care, then if that's what you think the purpose of health care policy is, then the fix, like we have a bunch of people who don't uh, get to go to the doctor, a bunch of people are employed, un, uh, uh, excuse me, uninsured or underinsured, it's expensive, people don't all have access, then you say, okay, well, how do we make sure, like what do we do? Now it could be expensive, it could be complicated, it could involve regulations, subsidies, government uh, participation, uh, public-private partnerships, the, the policy might actually end up being quite complex. But once you know what your purpose is, uh, then you can kind of start to put together the pieces. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more like it's just a cause and effect question. But this is the real, this is the real argument, right? This is where policy arguments, so policy arguments, policy fights are generally about purpose. And the mechanism, people are going to disagree about what the policy is and what the fix is, but uh, really the fight is prior to that. The different camps, the different reformers bring a set of policies to, they bring a set of fixes to the fight of what is the purpose. Now, with political reform, it's actually uh, kind of reversed. Generally, whatever piece of the uh, electoral system, excuse me, not the electoral system, that's just one piece of it. Whatever piece of the political system we're looking to fix, usually there's a purpose that's pretty straightforward, right? Like, so if, to use the example earlier, if there is a, a system to elect the president, you have a presidential system, there's one person who's in charge of the executive branch, which is what we have. A lot of systems have that as well. Uh, the purpose of the electoral system, the presidential electoral system, is to choose one person and to create uh, a competitive environment where you can actually get one person who, let's say more specifically than just the purpose is choosing one person, the purpose is to choose a person who is suited to the job, right, uh, as best as you possibly can, right, given that 
Um, voting is not necessarily the best way to interview uh, potential candidates for such a vast job as the President of the United States, but uh, that's the purpose. No one else is going to say, oh, no, 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 the purpose of the presidential electoral system is to what? Like, there, there really is no other purpose. So the purpose is there it, when we're talking about uh, electoral systems. The, the idea is, okay, the purpose is to give people representation in the legislature. Um, the purpose of the judicial system is to make sure that we have uh, um, free, or not free, um, fair trials. Uh, and speedy trials, and uh, that justice is done, and that justice is equally served. Some of the purposes get a little more complicated, a little, a, a little meatier, but nobody thinks that the system of justice is a marketplace. Uh, whereas when we talk about other kinds of uh, reform, people have a different view on what the structure's purpose is, right? For some people, the healthcare system is a marketplace, and so the problems with it is that it's a marketplace that's not functioning well. And other people say, no, the healthcare system is actually a place where people, people's well-being is uh, assured. Uh, and that's a completely different view. There are equivalent differences in what the judicial system is supposed to be about or what the legislative system is supposed to be about or what the executive system is supposed to be about. There are different ideas, of course, on how to do it, right? Should we have elected judges or appointed judges? That's the fix. That's, the, that, that's not saying, well, what the Supreme Court should be doing really is not what it's doing. It should be doing a whole, whole different thing. So we understand that for political, the purpose is fixed generally. Purpose is given. And the real question is how to make sure it's manifested. And that is relatively complicated because the purposes of political structures are kind of abstract, right? So for example, a, a democracy, a democratic system in general, uh, is supposed to be, a, a democracy means rule of the people. So, we know what the purpose of a democratic system is. It's to allow the people to rule themselves. No one disagrees with that. No one says, no, 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 the purpose of democracy is to, I, right, I don't know what. Like, there's no, the purpose of democracy is to give people a chance to compete. No. Uh, the, the purpose of democracy is to make people feel like they have power. No. Right? Maybe that's what happens. <laughs> people don't really have power, but it makes them feel like it. But we know that the purpose is to make sure that the people get to rule themselves. Well, how do they do that? And now, this is where the policy ideas will vary, will, will, will differ. So over here, other types of reform, welfare reform, healthcare reform, immigration reform, people are going to be arguing about the purpose. And every camp that has their purpose, right? The immigration system, the purpose of it is to keep America uh, pure, or the purpose of it is to ensure a uh, fresh influx of, uh, of uh, diversity and energy and talent. Or the purpose of the immigration system is to make sure that the United States is somewhat open but protective of its identity. You can see how these different purposes uh, are going to be what the fight is. And that for each of those camps, they will have a set of policies that really make sense. And it's not as though, well, okay, those of us who think that the purpose of the immigration system is to uh, ensure uh, kind of diversity of the nation, increasing diversity, that we get the best and the brightest, and we get the energy and intelligence and skills from the rest of the world to sure, ensure the vibrancy of our nation. If that's what you think the purpose of the immigration system is, you're, and someone else agrees with you, you're probably not going to have differences in what you think the immigration policy should look like or what immigration reform, where we are now and where we want to get to. You're probably not going to have, except for detailed, small detailed differences, you're not going to have big policy differences. But if you agree that we should have a democratic system, or if you agree that we, we're going to have a president, right? And uh, that's our Constitution gives us that. And so we have a president. We have to choose one person to represent, uh, not to represent, to head the executive branch for four years. How do we choose that person? That's where you're going to get it. People can agree on purpose. The purpose is a system that is going to get the one person to fill this particular job. And you can even say, well, of course, and let's say that everybody agrees that we want the best person for the job. Uh, 
then there's going to be a lot of different ideas. And so the fight happens here. This is where the argument is here. I'm going to try to keep these diagrams from getting too crazy, uh, but um, it's, it's maybe going to happen. I'm probably possibly going to have to erase at some point, but the great thing about videoing is if I do have to erase, is that there'll be a record of what this looks like. So, political reform, the purpose is given, usually, and uh, how to make sure it's manifested is the real question. Now, what is political reform? Political reform is the effort to fix the rules, procedures, and institutions of our political system. Now, one of the things that's actually great about political reform versus other types of reform, I don't know if it's great or not, but it's, it, it, it's a true thing, is that with other types of reform, the structure may be incomplete, or the structure itself may be in flux or possibly non-existent at all. Right? You can't have welfare reform until you have a welfare system. So at one point, there was actually no uh, reform. There was just creation. Um, there's a kind of an ongoing potential for creating and recreating systems here. Things can be added, they can be dismantled, they can be uh, taken apart and put back together again. So for example, after the terrorist attacks of uh, September 11th, 2001, there was a recognition that the uh, national security apparatus was broken, right? Like, how did this catastrophic terrorist attack happen? And then it kind of quickly became obvious to a lot of people that the information was all out there that could have allowed somebody, if, if, that, if somebody or some group of people had access to all this different information, to be able to figure it out and to stop it from happening. So that was considered to be a massive intelligence failure uh, and a, a massive national uh, security failure. So the idea was, oh, Shit, like this system is, it's broken, right? If we can't stop a catastrophic terrorist attack, then our national security system is definitely broken. Here's where we did have a purpose that was generally agreed on, right? Not all, not all uh, policy systems have, have this kind of disagreement. For sure, people agree that the system of, na the national security system is supposed to keep the nation safe, absolutely. And, it, and it's supposed to be able to do so proactively, not necessarily just reactively. Like, it's not enough to be say, to say, okay, well, great, here, this terrorist attack happened, we know where the people are, let's go kill them, right? That's certainly a useful thing, but the idea of national security is to actually prevent the attacks, the catastrophes before they happen. So there is a purpose. Um, and then in that case, there was a system in place that got completely juggled and dismantled, right? There were intelligence agencies and there were people doing terrorism and counterterrorism work in all kinds of different places. And what that particular reform effort was all about was reorganizing our national security apparatus to be more efficient, more unified, and more effective, yet to also make sure that there were still checks and balances in the system so that uh, intelligence uh, workers couldn't just you know, have a ton of money and do everything in secrecy and uh, abuse their power. So there was still a concern for also making sure that the system was set up in a way that, that power didn't get abused. But that was a case where the entirety of the uh, policy system was up in the air and could be rejuggled in, in lots of ways. The same thing is true, for example, of uh, the healthcare system. There are so many different elements to our healthcare system. There are, you know, hospitals and clinics, doctors, nurses, other healthcare providers. That's one aspect. There's pharmaceutical companies, there's uh, manufacturers of medical devices, there's uh, health insurance companies, there's employers uh, who are providing health insurance. Um, there's uh, all those different moving parts and then and the government only regulates or gets involved in certain aspects of that. Like the government actually runs veterans hospitals and provides uh, direct uh, uh, payment health sort of health insurance through Medicare and Medicaid um, so when you do other kinds of reform you can say well we could change the whole system right we can actually that's the idea behind Medicare for all is that the way the government interacts with the healthcare marketplace gets radically changed so you can create and recreate systems and that's actually part of what the policies are uh, asking for right um, like there's you know with to get back to the example of immigration 
there's no wall. Let's build a wall. That's actually a change uh, in, a, in a system. That's available. In political reform, the structures are all there. Right? They don't have to be built. Uh, we have a functioning system. Now, that's not to say that in, in theory we can't just take it all apart. Right? We have three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. And there's nothing, no, no rule that says that that has to be fixed, that we, that we can't take that system apart and create either two branches of government or five branches of government or, uh, you know, basically reinvent what we think uh, the government should look like. But pretty much in terms of the way political reform happens, those, what we could think of as really super foundational issues, are off the table. Because uh, we take it as a given that there are a certain set of institutions. Um, now, we don't necessarily know what those institutions are going to be like, but we have a system as it exists. We have a judiciary that has a Supreme Court with nine people on it, and they're appointed. And while we could make it be more than nine people, and we could uh, make it so that they are elected to a term, or they're appointed to a term instead of appointed to uh, a lifetime term, all of those details are, are up in the air. But the idea is not like, okay, let's, there's something wrong with the way justice is dispensed. Let's reinvent the judiciary from the uh, top to the bottom. The, what political reform usually looks like is a targeted effort to take something that isn't living up to the purpose, that's not living up to its mission, and making it closer to that. So, for example, if you say, well, the, the whole lifetime appointment of uh, Supreme Court justices, that's just, that's, that's terrible. Well, well, why? What's the problem? Okay, well, what the Supreme Court is doing, the purpose of the Supreme Court is to f decide foundational constitutional issues um, and to, uh, to make determinations on particular cases that have uh, constitutional importance. So, uh, we want our Constitution to be interpreted as well as possible in a way that will, what is the background uh, purpose? Is, is that people have a stability of expectations, that the Constitution doesn't change meaning constantly. So what's wrong with this system? Well, you could say, well, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be anybody deciding that at all. That shouldn't be in the hands of the judiciary. That should be in the hands of, like, the people should get to decide that. Um, that foundational question of, like, what is the role of the Supreme Court? That's really already been decided. The question is, how can we make sure that the way the court functions and the way people are put onto the court and the way they leave the court uh, stays true to that purpose of, gi of giving us a body that will interpret the Constitution in a way that is broadly acceptable to the American people, has uh, a high level of uh, stability in terms of expectations so that the Constitution is not constantly changing people. Maybe it does change, but it changes slowly over time. Then you can say, well, all right, what is wrong? And is there, is there anything wrong? Uh, this also reminds me that one of the things that happens or can happen, and this is part of the discussion when we, when we look at specific uh, issues in like, a specific type of reform, like taking Supreme Court justices and make their, <clears throat> making their terms of office not lifetime, is that the fixes that people propose, and this is very common, I hate this, like, oh, I can't believe that, that, that Supreme Court justices get to just stay on the court until they retire or die and they get really old and they, they get out of touch and there's no, like, they're, 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 they can be so disconnected from reality and from the everyday life of the people who, who are going to have to live with their rulings. You can say, that's just wrong, but then, well, okay, what's the, what, what are the alternatives? And when you propose an alternative, say, um, electing Supreme Court justices to, say, a 15-year term, then what you need to do is just instead of just saying, well, that gets rid of the problem. We know that the system as it works is, is, isn't, isn't right. Okay, does the fix, actually when we refer it back to the purpose, does the fix get us closer, right? If we have elected Supreme Court justices, is that going to uh, solve the problem that we have? Or is it just going to be something that's different? Now, one of the problems with uh, political reform, it's really a problem with all kinds of reform, but uh, I would say, and I'll give a couple examples in a minute, but it's less so in, in certain policy areas, is that the political system, as it functions, with the specific sets of rules, procedures, and institutions that exist at the moment, 
is usually pretty well understood, right? Like that's what political scientists do. That's, you know, in my other classes, I teach American government. Some of you have other classes with me. Given the uh, rules, procedures, and institutions that exist, it's relatively predictable. I mean, I can't always predict what's gonna happen, but it's relatively predictable how things go, and until there's a major change, they continue to go that way. Um, what is not known in uh, a, a political system is how are behaviors going to be transformed with a new system? Uh, one of the most transformative uh, political reforms that has uh, hit our country in the 21st century is the Citizens United uh, ruling, which uh, essentially allows outside money to circulate in our political system in a completely unregulated and uncontrolled and uncapped way. Um, now, the Supreme Court wasn't looking at our electoral system and saying it's broken and we have to fix it. Uh, this is actually one of the things about the judicial avenue of reform is that it obeys a different kind of logic, and I'll talk about this uh, in, in the next lecture. Um, it obeys a logic of like, okay, well, it, it's the, what's broken is that a thing doesn't fit the constitutional requirements, not that it's not working, right? It could be <clears throat> that the Bipartisan Campaign uh, Reform Act, uh, which, is, which is what Citizens United was about, works for its stated purpose, which is to make sure that the democratic system is uh, a fair one and that uh, money doesn't determine all outcomes. That's what the purpose of that piece of legislation was. Uh, the court ruling isn't saying, well, no, it's not doing that thing. Courts don't look at statutes and say, well, it's not meeting its stated purpose. It's failing to do that, so we have to change it. That's what legislatures do. Uh, when you get into a policy fight over reforming, say, campaign finance law, the question is like, existing law, does it do the thing that it's supposed to do? No. Or does it do it as well as it could? No. And so we make a change. Uh, so the legis legislative reform efforts uh, tend to look at the, like, the stated purpose of the statute, whereas judicial reform efforts uh, are aimed at aligning statutes uh, and executive actions with constitutional requirements. Um, but I'm getting a little off track here because the point of this is that when the Supreme Court made the Citizens United ruling and it changed things and it, it, it got rid of certain rules and it created certain kinds of opportunities, nobody really knew what the electoral system was going to look like in the post-Citizens United era because uh, the, what, what that does, what sort of uncapping money and what creating uh, a potential for unregulated uh, um, black box uh, cash in the political system, how is that? Who's, who's going to rush in with the money? We know it's going to be rich people and organizations, but like, are unions going to do this a lot? Uh, what are super PACs going to look like? How, how much are billionaires going to spend and, and in what way are they going to uh, spend their money? How are candidates and parties and campaigns going to react? Only in retrospect, when we see the new system of rules and procedures in the post-Citizens United world, can we then begin to figure out what actually is happening. Um, so the political changes are sort of unpredictable. Whereas with other kinds of policy, if you, uh, if you make a change, you usually know what that change is going to do, right? So for example, in the Affordable Care Act, if you uh, in, uh, include a tax penalty for people that don't have health insurance, there's nobody sitting there going, well, I wonder what that'll do, right? What it's going to do is it's going to get more people to get health insurance because whenever you penalize something, more people are going to do the thing to avoid the penalty. Now, what you don't know exactly is like how many people are going to do it uh, and is it going to eradicate uh, um, uh, the population of people who don't have uh, health insurance. Not eradicate them, I mean like they're gone. Sorry, that's a, uh, that's a, this is the wrong time to make slicing across the throat jokes, but you know, I can't help it. The darkness will creep in every once in a while. But uh, the, the, the individual mandate, the tax penalty, is not going to uh, reduce the population of the uninsured to zero, but it's known that it's going to reduce it. And it's also pretty well known that the higher the tax penalty, the more it's going to reduce it. Right? In the Affordable Care Act, the tax penalty was relatively modest. It was, I think it was like $1,000 or $1,500. I can't remember the exact amount. It's been uh, removed now. Uh, but there are going to be a lot of people who are like, yeah, you know, I'll just pay the penalty. So uh, legislators knew that, okay, if they set the penalty at $10,000, that would encourage more people. So in policy reform, in domestic policy anyway, foreign policy is a totally different issue because it's 
very unpredictable and the world is uncertain for sure. But in domestic policy, when you say, okay, here's what we're going to do, it's going to have a, a, a relatively predictable change. In political reform, because the political system itself is so foundational and political behavior is so uh, um, key towards the rules, procedures, and institutions that exist, uh, the behavior of people in the political system has adapted to this environment, right? This, is, this creates the environment of action for political actors. And once there's a system in place, uh, people adapt to it and it takes a little while. Like now that Citizens United is 10 years old, we can see, now it's pretty well known what uh, a post-Citizens United world is going to look like. But for the first few years, nobody really knew. Um, and in fact, behaviors were constantly in flux. That's one of the things that makes political reform tricky, is that you're, you're changing something that uh, is uh, essentially a well-adapted system. And all of the players in that system, all of the species in that environment, are in fact uh, well adapted and there is a kind of interdependence. It doesn't mean that it's 100% predictable. Like I can't predict who's gonna win elections just because we've had the same electoral system for a really long time. So there's a level of unpredictability uh, in there. But we know how candidates are gonna campaign, we know how money's gonna get raised, we know how money's gonna get spent, we understand the role that parties are gonna play and PACs and uh, endorsements. And then Citizens United comes along and introduces an entirely new piece to the electoral system, right? Unregulated, uh, uncapped, black box, outside money. What's that going to do? Because now we have a bunch of new players, new agents coming into this environment, in this brand new environment, and we have the same people who were in that environment before, right? So something like Citizens United really is kind of a meteorite that hits the political system. So in the case of a meteorite hitting uh, the Earth, that's actually, that's the opposite, that's actually well known. Right? It hits the Earth, it sends up a bunch of uh, dust, that blocks out the sun, it gets colder or hotter, I, no, I think it gets colder, right? Um, and in that particular case, I'm definitely not uh, up on all the geology of this stuff, just an example. But like, the meteorite hits and it's predictable. Citizens United hits and we don't know because people who were never involved, billionaire, super PAC, uh, um, uh, donors, um, outside groups that have never gotten involved in politics before because they didn't have the ability to funnel their resources through the pre-existing system of PACs and parties. Like, how are they gonna behave? New people are suddenly uh, in the system. Um, other changes can maybe be a little more predictable, like, you know, but still there's a high level of unpredictability. Let's say that um, Supreme Court justices were elected instead of appointed and they were elected to a non-renewable 15-year term. Um, it's hard to know, one, how are Supreme Court candidates going to campaign? Like, what's that gonna look like? Now, once we've had that system for a decade, um, or may maybe 20 years, because there aren't gonna be very frequent elections uh, for Supreme Court justices with a 15-year term, but once we've had that system for a while, we can say, okay, here's how it runs, but in, in, in prospect, in retrospect, we can know in prospect, like, what's it, gonna, what's it gonna do? How are candidates who are running for an office that nobody's ever run for before, how are they gonna behave? Now, we can look at other types, similar analogous systems. We can say, okay, there are um, Supreme Court justices at the state level who have to run for election, and there are other judicial positions, not at the federal level, because all federal judges are appointed, um, but in various states, and we can look at those systems and say, okay, here's how people behave. But we really don't know. Like, what would a national election for Supreme Court justices look like? And then what we really don't know is, okay, people get elected to a non-renewable 15-year term. It means they can't ever run again, and uh, they now, how are they gonna behave? Are they gonna behave like politicians? because it took a politician to win that election in the first place? Or are they gonna behave like justices who are people who think about the rule of law and constitutional interpretation um, and uh, don't think about public opinion but think about the meaning of, of, of the Constitution and you know, they have different views, conservative and, and liberal justices have different views on what the Constitution means, but they're not really tied to public opinion. It's not as though they're wondering, well, what do the people think? Um, liberal and conservative justices have different judicial philosophies. If we had elected non-renewable 15-year terms for Supreme Court justice, what is the 
nine people, what are the nine people going to do? How are they going to behave? How are they going to act? That is like, that's really very, uh, that, that's a difficult question to answer. Whereas if we change some part of the healthcare system, uh, or if we change some part of the immigration system, if we, we know that, okay, you put up a wall, that's going to reduce illegal crossings. Um, and uh, it's, you know, in the short term, as you build the wall, it might increase illegal crossings in certain other places, but there's, a, there's really kind of a cause and effect mechanism because we're really talking about people behaving in a certain way and then a new regulation or a new system or a new set of incentives and people respond pretty predictably to those. In politics, while it is true that a system of rules, procedures, and institutions has incentives and has regulations, when you make these changes, you're changing the environment enough that it's kind of hard to predict what the behavior is going to be like. Yet the proponents of different reforms are going to, of course, come with an argument. They're going to say, here's, this is broken, and here's my fix, and here's what it's going to look like. So there's going to be a claim, of course, and there's an attempt to predict what this change will do. And of course, part of the argument is, my prediction for how this will look in the future is that it will be better than it is now. It will be truer to the purpose of this particular institution. Right? Um, currently, the fear is that the Supreme Court has been highly politicized, and that it's very partisan, and that the makeup of the justices matters more than the meaning of the Constitution. Um, and the idea of the Supreme Court, at least one of its purposes, uh, exercising its power of judicial review, is to do as good of a job interpreting the Constitution as possible. Uh, so if somebody recommends you know, uh, cutting down the, the term from lifetime to, say, 18 years or 15 years, um, then they're going to say, well, that's going to make it less partisan. But we honestly really, really don't know. It could actually make it more partisan. Um, electing Supreme Court justices instead of appointing them is certainly going to, we know that one of the things that's going to happen is that the people who want to get on the Supreme Court are going to have to behave differently. Instead of, you know, being, you know, becoming a lawyer and getting, uh, you know, getting in with people who can recommend you to get appointed uh, to a judgeship and then getting uh, uh, a track record of rulings that get noticed by either a liberal or a conservative uh, organization, uh, that has the voice uh, or that has the ear of the Democratic and or Republican uh, administration, that's your pathway into the Supreme Court. Um, if it were an elected pathway, one thing we know is that people are going to behave very differently. But who's going to be drawn in? Are the same people, like, you know, if, if you're a 20-year-old right now and you want to someday be appointed to the Supreme Court, be on the Supreme Court, you know that by being, it's an appointed position, Here's, here's the track you have to go on. And it's, you know, there's only nine of them and very few openings come up. Uh, so like that's kind of a long shot. <clears throat> but if somebody told you, oh, in 10 years, they're changing it to, uh, to elected, you would do a very different thing. You would start now, instead of trying to get appointed to a judgeship and building up a record, you would uh, begin to learn political skills because you know that, that, the, that the threshold onto the court can only be crossed through an election. But what we don't know is because this is a type of election that we just don't have, right? We have them at the state level, but it is a different thing to be elected to the Supreme Court than even to be elected to a state Supreme Court, because the U.S. Supreme Court is the final word. It's like the highest stakes uh, public office you could possibly imagine. I would say even more so than the presidency, though, you know, people could, we could differ on that, and it's not important which one's more high stakes. They're both very high stakes. But we really just don't know who is going to end up trying to get these positions, right? Like Jeff Sessions, like I bet Jeff Sessions wants to be on the Supreme Court, right? I mean, he, he wanted to be Attorney General and that was like, sometimes you get what you want and you find out, oh geez, that's not exactly what I want, but I will bet anything that Jeff Sessions would die to get on the Supreme Court. He should, right? He should want to be. I don't think, I'm not saying he should be on the court, but he should want to be on the court. Um, he's not gonna be on the Supreme Court because you don't get on the Supreme Court in this current system by getting elected Senator and even by being appointed Attorney General. If, however, uh, there were a different system, elect an electoral system, if, if justices were elected to a 15-year non-renewable term, a guy like Jeff Sessions could end up getting on the court. But will he, right? Or would somebody like John Roberts, the Chief Justice, would he, back when he was younger, uh, would he have said, well, I want to be a, a federal judge, I want to maybe be on the Supreme Court someday, um, I'm going to learn political skills. We, we really don't know 
how people are going to respond to changes in uh, the fundamental nature of the political system. So I feel like I've probably made this point as uh, strongly as I need to. And um, what I do want to do uh, with the last bit of this lecture, oh, and just so you know, like maybe you're wondering, actually you're not wondering because you can see this is a video, you can see exactly how long it is, but maybe you're wondering to yourself like, oh God, is this gonna be an hour and 15 minutes every time? No, it's, it's definitely not. I'm going to go only as long as I actually think uh, the material requires, and the lectures will be different lengths on uh, different weeks for sure. But you'll know going in, uh, because there'll be a little number there on the, on the screen. Um, I feel like I need to maybe erase all this and uh, talk a little bit more specifically, uh, instead of contrasting these two, about what political reform is. So I'm going to leave this just for a second. I'm going to go over here and get my eraser and <clears throat> political reform is a transformation of the political system so what is the political system the political system in a democracy anyway has essentially two components to it there's an electoral system, and there's a governing system. And both of these systems are fully functional and fleshed out. In other words, there's nothing in either of these that is unregulated. There are no vacuums. There are no, uh, there are no black boxes. It's, uh, I mean, there may be black boxes as in people can spend unlimited money without telling where it came from in the electoral system, but we know that that's actually the rule. Other areas of policy, the, the system could be incomplete, the system could be new, the system could be really old, um, it could be partial, like we have, you know, we have a partially socialized healthcare system in the United States because uh, veterans get to use the Veterans Administration and uh, with uh, Medicare, that's we have a partially socialized, partially government subsidized system. There's room to have more government participation, more government regulation. In the political system, the, it's, all the room is already taken up. Everything is, is already decided. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't add more things, but that's actually still just putting them in a place that already exists, right? So our governing system, we have this, the, the standard, here's the, it's, we have the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. And then, of course, there's also a background, and it, this is not the scale, of course. We know that we have a bureaucracy as well that uh, is you know, kind of eminent in the entire system. But that's, that's what our governing system looks like. Now, we have specifics, and if we're talking about the federal level, in this class we're going to look at the federal, state, and local level, so uh, it won't always be about the federal government, but just to do this right now, at the legislative level, we have a bicameral system. We have the House and the Senate, and these guys have a six-year term, and these guys have a two-year term, and there are 435 of them, and there are 100 of them, and the 100 is set by the Constitution, two for each state, the 435 is set by statute, uh, by uh, um, Congress itself. The executive branch has a president and a vice president, and then it has all of the different uh, uh, cabinet departments and agencies. So we have departments and agencies. And these all, were all created by Congress. Right? And the judiciary, we have a pyramid with three levels. We have the Supreme Court, we have the appellate court, we have the trial courts, and these people are all appointed by the president through the Senate. I won't make this too complicated, but we, we have an entire system that's set up, and it has a lot of components, right? And there are a lot of things, actually, that about our political system that not everybody's aware of, but they're public knowledge. Like, for example, the House and the Senate have the power to decide their own rules of procedure, and 
Uh, that allows there to be, for one thing, that allows there to be a filibuster in the Senate and not a filibuster in the House because the Senate has decided that and the House decided a different thing. And actually the House in the 19th century had a filibuster. It just got really, they got rid of it because it was completely unworkable because the House was so, was so large and with uh, House members having a two year term, the, like the temptation to filibuster was just too strong and it was just, it was a mess. So they got rid of it. But every corner of this system has some rule or procedure or institution associated with it, right? And um, that means that also there is ample opportunity to decide that we want to fix something, that something is a problem. Um, so for example, Congress being self-regulating, that is potentially a problem. Like why? Because they, the people there get to make up their own rules of behavior. If there are ethics rules in effect in Congress, it's only because each house has created ethics rules for itself. Now that might seem really problematic. Like how do you let the people who are going to have to live by the ethics rules decide what those ethics rules are? Um, now, the, there are plenty of corners and there's plenty of places to criticize everything that happens in our uh, political system. What political reform is, is we say, well, we have a problem and here's where the problem is and here's a proposal to change the way that particular thing looks. But there's always, always going to be a big obstacle to doing that because there's a, everything is already being done. Right? The same thing is true for the electoral system. How do, we, how do we translate the electoral system basically takes the, essentially, we have the people over here, and the electoral system translates their votes into the people who get to do this stuff. Um, and the real question is, is the, and the, of course the electoral system has all kinds of features to it, right? We have, one, we have legislative elections, and we have executive elections. Um, and actually, in, at the states, and we're going to talk about state stuff, this is not just a class about the federal government, there's also judicial elections as well. They all look different. There's also um, part of, so, so these, are the, uh, these are the institutions and the rules. There are these institutions, and, and then there's also the rules. And then what's, what has happened is the, then there are a whole bunch of practices that uh, are part of the electoral system. Um, and political reform is going to be aimed at changing some feature of one of these two things. Uh, with the purpose, the ultimate purpose of one, of course, the, the real underlying purpose of political reform is to improve democracy. When I said before that part of reform is uh, staying true to your purpose and fixing the problem that has essentially made you not reach that purpose uh, as effectively as people want. Um, the, in, in political reform, the background purpose is always making sure that the people can rule themselves most effectively, most fairly, uh, in a way that actually translates the popular will into uh, the outcomes of the government. Because what we get here is the government gives us outcomes. And democracy says that these outcomes ought to be connected to the people. And clearly, there's a very complicated set of things that intervene between the people and the outcomes. Uh, the guiding purpose of a political reform idea, of a political reform movement, is that uh, the outcomes that we're getting fall short of what we think we should be having. And let's come up with a proposal to change either the rules or the institutions uh, that, uh, or the procedures that happen within them. So for example, a different type of example. Uh, the, we're right now it's kind of in a hiatus period because Joe Biden has really got the nomination pretty much locked up and also with coronavirus, the, how, are, you know, how are we gonna actually have elections, more primaries, but the, we're, we are actually officially in the middle of the Democratic presidential nominating process. And uh, this process that we have right now 
is a result of a wave of political reform from the early 1970s when the old system of turning, uh, of, of electing uh, the president, but it, the old system of actually deciding who each of the major parties' uh, um, candidates were, the old system seemed to be broken in the sense that the old system was largely driven by party insiders, party bosses, and the candidates who were selected didn't seem to be selected by the people, and that didn't seem very democratic, right? Uh, the, the two major party candidates were put forward by party insiders, uh, and that, that seemed like, a, like a, the wrong outcome, even though that had been the way that it had been, uh, the system had been working for well over 100 years. Um, the idea was, oh no, we can't, we can't allow our party's candidates to be divorced from the popular will of the people, not just the bosses and the insiders, but the people who identify with each particular party. So what they did was essentially had the delegates who choose the presidential candidate are themselves pledged to particular candidates that are voted on by uh, the people. So basically what the parties did was they took the electoral college and they turned it into the delegate college essentially, right? Whereas before, the delegates were people who got together at a convention and decided who the presidential nominee was going to be, like, like a real convention where people come together and argue and fight and discuss and then they make a decision. Our modern conventions are essentially just uh, mathematical exercises where the number of delegates that one candidate has have to be bigger than the number of delegates that have to be over a majority. It's really not a convention where anybody decides. But it's seen that that was a political reform because the idea that, uh, in this case, it doesn't go all the way to the outcome. The outcome here was the people getting to decide who their candidates are. So the, the outcome was internal to the electoral system. It didn't seem like that was the will of the people and there's a new uh, system. Now, again, this was done because there was something that was broken. But it was really hard to know what was going to happen. How are presidential candidates going to behave? Who is going to win the nominations under these new rules? What is the activity going to look like? How is it all going to solidify? Nobody really knew how it was going to solidify. We now know, because we've had the system for nearly half a century, we now know that winning Iowa and New Hampshire gives you front-runner status and that helps you... Uh, um, raise more money and get a lot of media profile. I won't go into all the stuff that we know, but we know how that system works. And, uh, but in 1972, when that system was devised and put in place at first, nobody really knew what it was gonna look like, including the candidates themselves who were vying for the presidency. There, it, was, it was that there was a problem, and they didn't, uh, the, the, uh, it seemed, the parties seemed to uh, think that like, okay, we have to introduce more popular democracy into our nominating process, and we're gonna do that. Um, and we're gonna have primaries and caucuses, and those primaries and caucuses will, will give us pledged delegates, which will be little mathematical tokens, getting people towards the, uh, the, the ultimate goal of having a majority of delegates and getting to have the nomination, but what is that system gonna look like? We don't know. If there's a call to change that system now, and I think there's a lot of momentum building to essentially get rid of Iowa and New Hampshire as the earliest voting states because they're very skewed uh, demographically, and they end up you know, basically, um, one of the reasons why the Democratic field narrowed so sharply, even before Iowa and New Hampshire, was that certain candidates just don't aren't going to do well in Iowa and New Hampshire. Right? If, you, if people of color don't do well in Iowa and New Hampshire, and so it shouldn't be surprising that all of the people of color were gone before, uh, even though there was a, a historically large field of Democrats with both women and people of color and women of color. It just like Iowa and New Hampshire are so important in the system that you can't even get to them unless you, pl you can't even get to the end of January if you don't play well there. That's, that's messed up, right? That's not the Democratic Party uh, or the Republican Party aren't Iowa and New Hampshire. But here's the thing. Let's say that the, the, one of the proposals is to go to a kind of a multiple Super Tuesday model, right? Um, maybe three or four Tuesdays in the late winter and spring where you know, let's say a third of the states vote on Super Tuesday number one, a third vote on Super Tuesday number two, and a third vote on Super Tuesday number three, and the first Super Tuesday number one has the biggest of the swing states among them, right? Florida, uh, um, Iowa, not Iowa, excuse me, Florida, Ohio, Virginia, um, Colorado, uh, maybe throw in like the 
Missouri and New Jersey, whatever, whatever it seems to make the most sense, right? And then Super Tuesday number two maybe has the biggest states. It has New York, it has California, it has Texas. Why? Well, the hope here is that it will be a process that actually finds a better candidate that's more fair and more open to different types of uh, presidential candidates being able to actually win the nomination. But if that change took place, we really don't know. And even campaign professionals don't exactly know. Like, how would you campaign? What would you do? Um, it might be that, you know, certainly one thing that's definitely going to change is we know that no one's ever going to go to the Iowa State Fair anymore. Right? Presidential candidates aren't going to have to pretend to like corn dogs anymore because the Iowa State Fair will be off their thing. We know that all of those dusty, gross uh, um, editors' uh, offices in New Hampshire, in these tiny, small city uh, newspapers, uh, presidential candidates are never going to sit in those rooms ever again. Right? But what we don't know is well, what our candidate's going to do. And what we really don't know is would that produce a better outcome? Right? It's going to be more competitive for a broader range of candidates. I think that's, we can assume that, that there's gonna be more diverse people who are gonna be able to actually make it through a Super Tuesday uh, number one like that. But it could just be that what is really gonna matter now is just money, right? When you have, say, 10 big states voting on, let's say, the third Tuesday in February, if that's where you put Super Tuesday number one, um, or the first Tuesday in March, whenever, whenever it happens to be, like, it could just be that the candidates are going to just spend a ton of time in the year running up to that raising money so they can just blitz the airwaves in those big states because the states are too big. That's the thing about Iowa and New Hampshire. They're small um, and they have a relatively homogenous population so you can kind of get on the ground and do it. Different candidates are going to try different things. Is it going to be a better outcome to change the nominating process to one where there are, say, three Super Tuesdays, and we start in the first one with a third of the states and the biggest of the swing states. It could be that that actually ends up being worse. Um, now, I don't want to make an argument here, or seem like I'm making an argument, that we shouldn't engage in political reform because it's unpredictable. Um, the, I just am noting that one of the things that does make political reform kind of a very uh, problematic endeavor is that you can make claims about what a new way of doing things is going to look like. But those claims are really way more speculative than the people who are making those claims would like you to think. Um, and they may think they're right, but they really don't know. And as we think about reform proposals in this class, we're absolutely going to be talking about, or actually I'll be talking at you, sorry, we won't be doing a whole lot of back and forth talking, but I'll be talking at you, um, people are going to make those claims. The advocates of different reforms are going to make those claims. But, and you're going, to read, uh, you're going to read a bunch of stuff about people who say, we should do this thing, and here's why, because this is what people are going to be like, and here's why it's going to be better. Definitely being skeptical of those claims is uh, part of our intellectual endeavor in studying political reform. Because those people however self-assured or however certain they might sound that if we do this, it's going to uh, uh, land in a certain way in the real world, the real world is gonna change in this particular direction. We really don't know. The political system itself, not only complicated, but it's an environment in which the people who are behaving in it right now are well adapted to the current environment. And when we change that environment, Unlike a meteorite hitting the earth where we know, well, that's going to change the environment in a certain direction and certain species are going to die out and certain species are going to flourish more. Um, when we have a meteorite that hits the political system, we don't necessarily know. So uh, there will be, there's some predictability, right? Like I said, if, if we went to elected Supreme Court justices, absolutely, we know that the people who are going to get there are going to have political skills. You're going to need political skills. And so uh, we, what we don't know is what kind of political skills, how are they going to campaign, and we really, really don't know how those kinds of people are going to behave once they are essentially beyond politics. They're, they have a 15 year term, they can't ever run again. Um, are their political instincts gonna just disappear and they're gonna think like, uh, like uh, lawyers? Or are their political instincts going to be half and half? Are their political instincts gonna be all they have? Are we gonna have an even more partisan court or, or is it going to be more fair? We really just don't know. People will make those claims. So as we go through the, the, the political reforms that we're going to look at, we're going to look at a lot of specific ones in this class, um, that's one thing to pay attention to. 
uh, is that there's a high level of uncertainty. But of course, you have to make those claims. Otherwise, you're just going to throw up your hands and say, well, let's just, we know, you know, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Like, we know how the system works, and we know what happens, and we know what the problems are, and we just have to live with those problems. We don't have to live with those problems. Political reformers are people who uh, say, here's a problem. We have a highly partisan uh, um, Supreme Court, or we have a gridlocked Congress, or we have uh, now, t we've had twice in the last 20 years a president who got elected who didn't have the majority of the popular votes. These are all problems. So uh, instead of just saying, well, you know, uh, we don't know what it's going to be like if we change it, political reformers are going to take that risk. They're going to, they're going to, you know, open this up to, they're going to claim that we need to, you know, open up to some kind of different approach and hoping and claiming that the cure is actually better than the disease. Sorry, again, I can't help uh, making the, noting that here we are in the coronavirus global pandemic and I'm using uh, disease and cure metaphors, but it's gonna happen. Uh, <clears throat> I hope that, that, that there's a, like, that it's not totally dark every time I mention these things. It feels a little dark to me right now uh, as I do it on day 14 of self-quarantine and it's, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a lot of days. This, this is gonna, I'm gonna probably have to make my check marks a little smaller to the left of them. Uh, onto the board. In fact, I think I'll probably have to do that. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> digression over. Um, one last word about political reform, and I'm going to get into this very specifically on Thursday, not on Thursday, in the next video, I'll, I'll adjust to this, uh, is that because of the uncertainty of changes and because of the foundational importance of our political system, Right? All of our other efforts of reform happen through our political system. If you want healthcare reform, immigration reform, welfare reform, national security reform, tax reform, whatever kind of reform you want, it happens through our governing system. So political reform is foundational. It affects how all the other forms of reform are played out. Um, and yet it's, it's, it's more unpredictable. So it's more important, and yet it's more unpredictable. What that does is that creates a relatively high barrier to change. Um, when you want to change the political system, it is very, very difficult to do so. It's hard enough to change the healthcare system, the immigration system, the national security system, any of the policy systems that we have. It's hard enough to make those changes, right? And that's partly because of the way our governing system is set up, and it's, it, it's intentional. We have a very status quo oriented uh, federal government. At the state level, less so, though still it's very difficult to make changes. At the local level, again, even less so, though still it's, it, it, it's, it's difficult to make changes. But the political system, the reason why it's so hard to change is, one, it's unpredictable, and two, because of its importance, and because people are more naturally, not everybody, but, but in aggregate, more naturally risk-averse than risk-taking, it seems more dangerous to transform uh, political form than it does to experiment with uh, some kind of policy change, right? Um, so there's automatically, psychologically, and I would say uh, systemically, it is very difficult to create a successful movement for political reform. Um, and maybe that's a terrible thing because it means that we can't experiment at this foundational level, but maybe it's a good thing also because what it means is when we do get changes, they're gonna happen uh, sort of slowly and incrementally, and we'll have a chance to see how they settle in uh, before then saying, well, we wanna make some other kind of big change. Uh, so there's pros and cons, but the truth of political reform is that it is a very obstacle-ridden, status quo-oriented kind of endeavor. There are so many more political reforms that are dreamt of and that are pushed for by people that don't have a chance in hell uh, like maybe after all the examples I've given here of, of uh, elected Supreme Court justices, once elected for a 15 year term, um, non-renewable, maybe that sounds good to somebody. Maybe a lot of you, are th some of you are thinking like, hey, that, like, this is where I would love, I would love to be able to have actually a group of students out here. So I say, how many of you think that would be a good idea? So uh, I'll do that, even though it's completely artificial. Like how many of you think that's a good idea? I can't hear you, sadly. Um, actually, I guess you know, I can put up a poll. Uh, that's one of the things I can do in D2L. I'm not gonna, 
that I could put up a poll. But anyway, some people, either you guys listening or someone out there, you know, might think that's a really, uh, really great idea. But we're never going to have that because that would be a fundamental change, and it would require constitutional amendments and a constitutional amendment, and that's just you know. Constitutional amendments are very difficult, and certainly ones that are this transformative are really almost in the impossible category, right? Like, that's a sci-fi world where we have elected Supreme Court uh, justices. So there are, there are certain things that are just so, like, unlikely. Now, that doesn't mean that, that political reform is all political reforms are in that camp. We're like, oh, no, that would be great. I think we should have elected 15-year terms, but we're never going to get there. That sucks. The world sucks. And our, you know, like, we, that's, that, that, that's, that's what's wrong with our system as a whole, is that we can't get from where we are to some of these things that would be better. Um, not everything is that inaccessible. Now, in the next lecture, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the four different avenues of political reform. Because there are four ways that changes can be made in this system. Uh, and I'll just preview those right now. And this is in sort of uh, um, uh, descending order of strength and ascending order of ease. Uh, the first mechanism is uh, the constitutional, constitutional change. Either rewriting a constitution or passing constitutional amendments. Um, that is the most foundational way to change things. Um, and so it is, the, it is the most permanent, the most enduring, and the most transformative. Uh, and so it's probably just, you know, having saying all those things, uh, that's, that should indicate uh, why it's actually probably a good thing that it's the most difficult. Uh, we're going to look at, in this course, later on a couple weeks, I don't have my syllabus with me, so I don't know exactly what it is, but at, at some point we're going to look at different state constitutions and how uh, different states... Uh, allow for change to the state constitution, and it actually varies quite widely. The U.S. Constitution is extremely difficult to change. Two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate, and then three-quarters of the states for any constitutional change. It's one of the reasons why we've only had 27 amendments, and really the first 10 came in one block, so we've really only had 17 amendments, and we haven't had one since 1992, so it's been now almost, I mean, it's been over a third of a century since we've had a constitutional amendment. I don't see any come along. There's always proposals for certain ones, balanced budget, flag burning, uh, gay marriage, like there's, there's all kinds of uh, proposals, but they really have uh, no, you know, no realistic possibility. Um, second type of, the second avenue is the statutory avenue. And uh, the statutory avenue is available because so much of what goes on in our, in our political system, while the, the basic structure is set out by the Constitution, so much of the detail is filled in by statute, by laws passed by the legislature. Right? So, for example, I already mentioned it before, the reason there are 435 members of the House of Representatives is because that's what Congress decided. It was a little over 100 years ago, I think it was 1890-something, when that number was raised from whatever it was before, and it's been left there since. The reason we have nine Supreme Court justices is because of a statute. Right? The reason we have these three levels of uh, 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 courts in the judiciary is because of statute. The reason we have the different departments and agencies that we have uh, the reason why there are certain restrictions uh, on uh, um, voting and certain rules and requirements is because of statutes. Now, a lot of the statutes that govern our electoral system are actually state laws because uh, the states have uh, control over elections, even for national office. So the statutory uh, avenue is available. And in fact, so much of our political system was built up through statute. And it is, it, while I won't say it's common, because it still happens very infrequently, and it's very difficult to make a statutory change. One of the reasons why uh, statutory change is, is, is an avenue is because so much of the system is governed by laws, not by the Constitution. Um, but we have, and I'll talk about this on Thursday for sure, I keep saying Thursday, I'll talk about this in video too for sure, uh, the, we have a very particularly at the federal level, but even at the state levels, we have a very status quo-oriented legislature. So the statutory avenue is a difficult one. It's way easier to block a change than it is to get a change through. Um, <clears throat> so one example, right after Citizens United was uh, ruled, there was a group of bipartisan senators who didn't like the Citizens United ruling and thought that 
there needed to be a decent level of regulation of our electoral system to make sure our, our democracy wasn't just flooded with money. And they came out and said, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna pass a piece of legislation that's going to address the things that have been taken away from us in Citizens United, but it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because it's, it was way easier for people who thought they would like Citizens United, many of them were right and some of them were wrong actually, uh, it's kind of bitten some people on the ass, um, but it was way easier to block it. So the statutory avenue is way easier to block. The third avenue is the judicial avenue, which is uh, because the courts, and the Supreme Court particularly, interprets the Constitution in light of, or excuse me, interprets uh, the Constitution uh, up by applying it to statutes. So all of those statutes that govern our political system uh, are uh, amenable to judicial review. And uh, because you don't need to have elected officials to agree in two different bodies, and then a, another elected official, the president, to sign off on a Supreme Court ruling, you need five people, just five people, to make a foundational change. That's a way easier avenue. Now, um, as I'll talk about in lecture two, in video two, the uh, opportunities for changing the political system through the judicial avenue are smaller, right? Because if there's a statute that you don't like and you uh, find a way, as an organization, you find a way to create a lawsuit that can get that, that statute or that portion of that statute to the Supreme Court, um, it's, you, there's basically, you can only do that if there's a constitutional problem. If you don't like the fact that there's only 435 members of the House because you think it's too small, uh, that doesn't, there's no way that that violates the U.S. Constitution. There's, there, there's no legitimate judicial review, active judicial review that's going to that's gonna strike that down. Um, so if you don't like that, or if you don't like the fact um, that there are uh, certain you know, departments or agencies that are created in the executive branch. Like, you don't like the Department of Homeland Security. You think that that's a problematic political structure because it puts too much power into the hands of this vast, super-funded uh, entity. The, that's not amenable to judicial review. Um, so judicial review is actually e easier, but less useful. The final uh, uh, mechanism for political reform is not available at the federal level but it is available at the state level in about half the states. So it's not available at the federal level at all, and it's only available at the state level in about half the cases, and that's direct democracy. And it is the most available avenue, the, the, the places that it exists, because the people themselves can, by putting something on the ballot and a yes or no vote, uh, which is very much not the same as legislative action, right, where we have two different bodies of people who themselves had to get elected first, then doing yes or no votes, and then it has to be approved by somebody who's elected separately. Direct democracy is just one vote, yes or no, and it's and it, and, and there's no mediation. So that 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 avenue is the most available. Um, but again, it's not available at the federal level, and it's not available at the state level in about half the states. So uh, while it's the easiest path, it is also the most uh, attenuated path. So those are, the, those are the ways. Each of those particular uh, avenues, and I'll talk in the next lecture in greater detail about each one of them, each of those does have obstacles to change. So political reform is a very obstacle-ridden endeavor. And that's probably where I ought to end, and I'll see you all in the next video.